good afternoon to all of you. Uh, we are here thanks to you, you Yuis. And uh, this afternoon we have with us uh, Kathleen Sullivan. She's the head of the Division of Allergy and Immunology at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She works uh, both in DNA folding and, uh, and immunodeficiency. She, she makes uh, translational work and um, she, she told us in their uh, biography that uh, she she wanted to to put together innovation uh, and clinics because they can impact the lives of the patients uh, of each patient uh, and uh, she is going to talk us about uh, COVID and what happens when it reach an immunocompromised one and how to get some extent of immunization uh, against it. So uh, when you want, Kathleen. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see my slides yet. I think they're just arriving. Here we go. So first of all, a big thanks to IUIS for inviting me. I've been watching the IUIS webinars on COVID-19. They have largely been about pathogenesis, and I'll actually refer to a couple of them because they do intersect with the topic that I'm covering today. So I'm going to be talking about what happens if an immune-compromised patient gets COVID-19. Now, my expertise is primary immune deficiencies or inborn errors of immunity, and I'm part of the Inborn Errors of Immunity Committee in IUIS. So that's my expertise, but as you'll see, there's not a huge amount of data. And so I think helpful to look at other immune compromising conditions to give us some insight. And for me, it's been very surprising. I don't know if it will be surprising to all of you, but let's get started and I'll take you through the data. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about pathogenesis, really just to frame the conversation about what cells we think are important and what's driving this powerful inflammatory response that really is so surprising about this virus. I'll talk about different types of immune compromise, inborn errors of immunity, and then just a couple of slides at the end that are just thoughts about what, what can we do about vaccination in these circumstances. And I do have all of my references at the end. There's quite a few papers that I will cite that are on bioarchive, they're not published in print yet. And so I wanted everyone to have access to those. So let's get started. This is not meant to be um, a very comprehensive coverage, just to frame the discussion about why aren't immune deficient patients getting as sick as we think they should. So let's get started. Now, any immunologist, even from college on, would be able to draw something that looks like this. So I'll just walk you through this. This shows the symptoms. So from the time of inoculation, there's an asymptomatic period. There's a period of peak symptoms and then recovery. This green line is showing IgM and this red line is showing IgG. This happens to be drawn for SARS-CoV-2 immune responses, but it could be for anything, right? All responses to viral infections look like this. But clearly there's something a little different about the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So let me um, try and break it down into sort of two categories. Now this is completely unfair. We know that patients aren't either spontaneously recovering or in the hospital, that there's quite a broad spectrum with some patients being completely asymptomatic, some with very, very mild symptoms, a mild cough, some with enough that they might need a little oxygen or be quite short of breath. And then within the hospital, there's a World Health Organization categorization for mild, moderate, and severe. So within the hospital, there can be patients that need an intensive care unit and patients who need much less. But that spectrum is hard to manage. And so I'm going to just sort of schematically talk about it as people that spontaneously recover and people that get quite sick. So from the time of infection, it's about five to seven days before people become symptomatic. Most people with symptoms do have a fever, but certainly not everyone. And then over the course of the next week, people will declare themselves. They, were, they will either spontaneously recover or at least be on the way to recovery, or they will be getting consistently sicker and sicker and require hospitalization. So again, not fair to partition it like a dichotomous variable, but 
just for the ease of conversation, I'm going to, <coughs> excuse me. So um, this is trying to schematize what we think is going on for the people that spontaneously recover. So at the time of infection, there's quite a bit of type 1 interferons that are expressed by stromal tissues, the actual cells that are infected, as well as bystander cells. So that's all going on for the first week as the virus replicates, coincident with onset of symptoms. And then there's the production of antibodies, as you see. And then I've got a little diamond that's meant to represent T cell expansion. So usually in a viral infection, peak T cell expansion is going to be at about a week. And so I don't mean to make it look like the T cells are going away. I'm just trying to indicate that there is this wave of virus responsive T cells that expand. Well, what's different in the folks who go to the hospital or are severely ill, so the same thing happens. We think that the dominant feature that is responsible for the, the severity of the illness is the production of cytokines and chemokines. Now, I have to confess, those data are um, imperfect, and we, there's clearly quite a learning curve that's going on with COVID-19, but we think that these um, inflammatory mediators are driving a lot of the severity that we're seeing. And the reason is that we think that the pulmonary edema, the myocarditis, hepatitis, kidney injury, and vasculitis are largely due to these inflammatory cytokines. I would refer you to one of the IUIS webinars previously that talked about the thrombotic complications, which I think are really profound and not unique in this virus, but definitely places this virus at the far end of the spectrum. And I think those thrombotic effects are actually secondary, at least in part, to these inflammatory cytokines. So I don't mean to diminish thrombosis because I think it is a major contributor to the severity and the end organ damage. I just see it as downstream of the inflammatory cytokines. So if you accept that this is true, that there are inflammatory cytokines driving a lot of the end organ damage, then no surprise, a lot of treatments have focused on um, suppressing that cytokine storm, bringing it down, doing something to minimize the downstream consequences. So the data that are best are for steroids. How old-fashioned can you get? So the best data that's out there, in my mind, supports the use of corticosteroids for the folks that are on this very severe end of the spectrum. And we presume, without clear knowledge, that it works by minimizing these inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, as you'll see in a minute. There's other good data for tocilizumab, which is an IL-6 monoclonal antibody, IL-6-directed monoclonal antibody. There's pretty good data to support anakinra as an IL-1 blocking agent. And then there's less good data um, to support the use of JAK inhibitors or gamma interferon targeted therapies. And then a little bit of data on TNF inhibitors, which I'll talk about when I talk about biologics. Now, I need to make a point that is painful for all of us in immunology. So as immunologists, we're very used to drawing blood. We see it as a reflection of the immune response. We can capture it and measure it. There's good normative values. We're very accustomed to accessing blood and looking at it as a marker for disease. I think this paper by Damon et al. actually gives us just a little caution in that regard. And it's probably true in many states. I just think that these data are particularly pertinent. So I know it might be a little bit hard to see, so I'll just describe what's going on. So the black bars are the chemokines and cytokines in blood. The white bars are from autopsy lung tissues. And the gray bars are from bronchoalveolar lavage specimens. And in this top set of graphs, they're measuring chemokines. And in the bottom set of graphs, they're measuring cytokines. Now, I don't expect you to read each and every label. I want you to just cast your eyes on this graph and notice how low the black bars are, the cytokines and chemokines in blood, compared to the lung tissue and the bronchoalveolar lavage. You can see that the blood is actually very quiet compared to the lung tissue. Now, again, I don't think this is unique to SARS-CoV-2, but I think it really is a word of caution because we're interpreting so much data that we're getting from blood work. Now, this is actually RNA-seq of blood. And so this is a heat map. Um, really, 
um, you've seen a million heat maps. Across the top is disease severity in the different colors, and I'll say more about that in a minute. But if you just sort of take an artist's viewpoint of this heat map, if you will, it is rather quiet, right? So you can see some differences. So the severe patients are over on the right. They are the maroon color. But if you look at these data, it's really not very dramatic compared to the clinical severity of the disease, which is quite dramatic. So what I've done is I've boxed two regions and up here at the top, you'll see a little maroon box. That's to sort of denote the more severe patients. But I picked these two regions that did show clear differences. The one that gets um, a little stronger is T cell activation and DR expression. And then this darker blue down here is TEMRAs and intermediate monocytes. Oh, sorry. So there have been a lot of efforts to try and get around this issue that we're just not seeing a lot of cytokines and chemokines in the blood. That's not to say they're not there. So at my hospital, we run a cytokine panel on virtually every patient. So yes, they are there. It's just surprising that it, that the degree of cytokines that we find in the blood does not um, seem as dramatic as what the clinical conditions are. So this is a slightly different effort by Chevrier et al. And I'll apologize for the quality of this figure. It's taken off of BioArchive. And so it's just a, a PDF snapshot. So the quality is not that great. But what you should notice, and I'm going to try and draw here, there are some tools. Let me just see. Uh, maybe not. Um, if you look at the green dots that are up against the left-hand axis, those are normal controls. This top set of panels that are kind of boxed in orange, those are classical monocytes. The red lines represent severe patients and the blue lines represent the mild and moderate patients. So they segregated patients according to the World Health Organization guidelines. And so blue is both mild and moderate, red is severe. You can see there's not a lot of differences, but all of the classical monocytes are depressed compared to normal controls. If you look down at the bottom left, which I'm not going to talk about, those are intermediate monocytes. And what I really want to focus on are those bottom right four panels. So those bottom right four panels are a very unusual type of monocyte. Notice that the green dots from the normal controls are essentially zero. These are not monocytes that are seen in healthy donors. And these monocytes have, although there's four different subsets, these monocytes are held together conceptually by their expression of CD169. So notice also that these cells are present on the first day when the patient walks in the door. So this is a very early marker, even if it doesn't really discriminate between mild and severe, this rather unique myeloid cell that you might not have ever thought about measuring has come out from single cell RNA-seq as one of the early biomarkers of COVID-19. Now this same paper also identified a cytokine signature that early on segregated patients severe and mild. So up here in the top left, again, the red line are the severe patients and blue is mild to moderate. And the red line in the upper left corner is gamma interferon. Notice how high it is in the severe patients compared to the mild patients. And again, I just want to highlight that this is on the day that they walk in the door. So there are other cytokines that evolve over time, but this seems to be one cytokine that can discriminate early. So I don't want to belabor that because I'm not here to talk about um, pathogenesis, but I think it does say something to us about the relevant cell types, and I think highlights a potential role of myeloid cells, a cell that we might not have been that, um, I don't wanna say not interested in, but we might not have paid that much attention to. So again, I'm gonna come back to the schematic sort of bifurcation in the timeline. So for the people that are hospitalized, we do see this high ER expression of cytokines and chemokines, and we see evidence of early myeloid activation. And again, I like to highlight that because I think it's just not, it wasn't something that was necessarily so obvious. And I think really revealed by the power of single cell RNA-seq, you wouldn't have come up with that probably any other strategy. 
So let's transition from this little brief overview of pathogenesis to the known risks for severe disease. So this is taken from the Centers for Disease Control. And if you just cast your eye on this list, these are risks for bad outcomes for anything, for trauma, for major surgery. These are just conditions associated with poor outcome, right? So type 2 diabetes, obesity, COPD, these are markers for poor outcome in almost any circumstance. What's surprising is there's nothing here that screams immune system, right? Yes, kidney disease and diabetes are associated with chronic inflammation, as is obesity. But notice that we're sort of lacking, other than solid organ transplant, we're lacking other conditions where we really think the immune system is suppressed. And in fact, I know you all know this, but it's worth saying out loud, the single biggest risk factor for mortality and hospitalization is age. So that has by far the biggest effect on any epidemiologic study of COVID-19. And while these happen to be data from New York City, it's true in every country that's looked at it. Age is the dominant risk factor for disease severity. So it's worth, I'm just going to come back to this idea about myeloid cells. So when I think about the immune system aging, I think primarily about T cells, right? Thymic involution and contraction of the naive T cell compartment, acquisition of Timra cells, features of senescence and exhaustion, some expanded oligoclonal T cell population. So when I think about aging, I usually think of the T cell compartment as being kind of the driving force for what we think about the clinical aspects of aging, which would be resurgence of herpes infections and susceptibility to bacteria. But I just want to make one point that the myeloid compartment also ages. So this is a, um, it's an in vitro study of listeria. Now, listeria is interesting because it's one of the other pathogens where essentially the entire risk for disease severity is age. So if you don't know the condition, listeria is sort of inconsequential in most young adults, but by the time you're over 80, your risk of stroke and bad outcome goes much, much higher. So they chose to look at elderly individuals and monocyte responses to listeria. So just take a look at the young adult and the baseline. So this is, again, in vitro. So the baseline difference between the older adults and the younger adults is already apparent. The older adults are already hyper-expressing inflammatory cytokines with no stimulation whatsoever. There's a little bit of difference at the one-hour time point, but when you go to the six-hour time point, you can see that the older adults have more persistence of inflammation in their monocytes. So I, I'm not saying this is uh, anything related to COVID-19. I'm just saying I think the myeloid compartment deserves a little more attention, and maybe it is relevant for the age effect, at least in part. So with all that being said, and with our understanding of the pathogenesis, let's look at some clinical conditions where um, I think there are some surprising results. So HIV. So the first paper to come out on HIV patients is from Spain. And this paper by Viscara, if you look towards the bottom, so there's two columns, there's mild or moderate patients and severe patients, and they're comparing each of the features between the two, and the p-value is over on the right-hand column. So if you look at the bottom, you'll see that there's no difference between mild, moderate, and severe depending on T-cell count. Now, that's a little surprising, right? We think that T-cell counts are important for containment of the virus and eventual eradication, but in this study and in a couple of others I'm going to share with you, the T-cell count had nothing to do with disease severity. That's a little surprising, right? We're used to thinking of it as a risk factor for influenza. We're used to thinking of it as a risk factor for other infections. But with COVID-19, at least with the data that we have available right now, it does not seem to be a significant risk factor. Let me share with you a bit more data. Now, these are not, the top two are not published. There was a large AIDS conference about two weeks ago, and these were abstracts that were presented. So both of these come from New York. They're both rather large HIV cohorts. But again, the rates of hospitalization, no difference. Um, and there was no dependence on T-cell count or CD4 T-cell count. 
they did note in this second one by Ho coming from Mount Sinai that there was a slightly higher rate of inflam or a slightly higher level of inflammatory cytokines, but no difference in hospitalization, and they could not identify a T cell count that conferred increased risk. Now, I do want to contrast with that because there is one paper from South Africa that did find that HIV conferred an odds ratio for mortality of two. So there, there may be a spectrum. And so I'm not sure we should say that HIV is for sure no risk factor. But based on the largest studies, it's not a major risk factor for sure. And again, just so surprising that T cells are not important. Well, let's look at cancer. So here's an iatrogenic immune suppression. So there's a couple of large studies out there as well as others that have been a little more formal in looking at one type of cancer or another type of cancer. I don't wanna linger on this. I just wanna say again, surprisingly, um, and I'll show you the data about chemotherapy in the next slide, being on active chemotherapy, having cancer, not a risk for hospitalization, severity, or mortality. Really surprising, right? So this largest study by Kuderer, the only aspect of cancer that they found was a risk for mortality was progressive cancer. So you could have metastatic disease, that was not a risk, but if the cancer was actively progressing, that was a risk factor for mortality. So let me just amplify that study a little bit. So they looked at increased risk factors for mortality. Notice it's the same risk factors that the CDC found in the general population. The one that is different and worth just spending a moment on is the use of immune checkpoint inhibitors. So those were associated with an increased risk of mortality and severity. But surprisingly, chemotherapy was not. Um, and remember chemotherapy, immune suppressive, immune checkpoint inhibitors, they are meant to increase the immune response. So I think it's actually quite surprising that there's just not much signal that immune suppression is significant in terms of um, disease severity. So let's just look at biologics. So I've already highlighted that biologics can be used therapeutically, but worth looking at it. I think at the beginning of the COVID outbreak, people imagined that the biologics would confer increased risk, just as they do for hepatitis, tuberculosis, um, and various other infections. But that has not turned out to be the case. So I'm going to highlight this paper by Gian Francesco, which is a global multinational study. It's a registry study. So the depth of data is not great, but I think it's very strong because it looks at so many different conditions. So they, um, they found the same risk factors for hospitalization as is true in the general population. So we'll just say that again. They looked at conventional disease modifying drugs. Now they define these in sort of a funny way. So it includes things like prednisone, tacrolimus, cyclosporin, but it also includes things like methotrexate. So these conventional disease modifying drugs increased hospitalization, but biologics did not. They actually decreased hospitalization. And I'm just going to show this paper from New York that has a little bit more depth to it, and it um, partitioned out different types of biologics. So you can see the different types of blocking agents in the left-hand column, TNF inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitors, IL-23, IL-12, JAK inhibitors. And then if you look at the column towards the right where it says odds ratio, you can see that these biologics and the small molecule JAK inhibitors absolutely do not confer an increased risk of disease severity. It's really quite um, dramatic that these cytokine inhibitors, if anything, are probably helpful and not deleterious. So you can, you can use biologics that we know increase the risk of other viral infections, and yet they don't for COVID-19. I think, again, a little bit surprising. So I'm going to um, transition now and talk about inborn areas of immunity. I think these are important both for patient care. I also think they're important because they really illustrate aspects of host defense against COVID that, again, are perhaps a little bit surprising. Now, I'm going to start by saying the CDC does list primary immune deficiencies in their list of risks, but it has an asterisk, and it says that there's very limited evidence. So what they cite 
are three large studies from China that are about the epidemiology of COVID-19 and then one kind of meta-analysis. So in those large studies of a thousand patients with COVID-19, you will see immune deficiency listed as a comorbid condition, but the immune deficiency is not further defined and we don't know whether there's some um, iatrogenic immune compromise in there as well. So it's hard to know what to make of those very large studies specifically for inborn errors of immunity. I think they're incredibly valuable in many other ways. Oh, so let's start with B cells. So uh, as you know, Italy was impacted by COVID-19 quite early. And so a good bit of data initially came from Italy. And I do wanna highlight this study from Isabella Quinti. So she studied seven patients with antibody deficiencies. Two had agammaglobulinemia and no B cells, and five had common variable immune deficiency, which is a, an antibody deficiency that is not especially well understood, but is um, largely a humoral immune deficiency, but most often with B cells present. So one of seven patients died, so not so different than the general population, although certainly unfortunate for the patient who died. But I wanna highlight this paper because in the discussion, Isabella highlighted the fact that in her opinion, the two patients with agammaglobulinemia did better than the patients with common variable, that they had shorter hospital stays and they overall did better. And so it's just a comment in the discussion, but I think it really captured people's attention. Now, around the same time, another Italian study came out by Soracina who described two patients with X-linked agammaglobulinemia, another condition where there's no B cells. Both patients developed pneumonia, which was presumed to be bacterial, but recovered pretty uneventfully and didn't seem to have any evidence of ARDS or any evidence of um, some of the things that land people in the intensive care unit. So I wanna sort of um, leverage that data because I think there's a little suggestion that maybe B cells are deleterious with this study that used a calibrutinib. So this is a BTK inhibitor that's used for malignancies, largely CLL. It's a small study, it's not controlled. But the authors clearly felt that the acalabrutinib was um, enormously beneficial to their patients. So there's multiple sentences in the paper where they talk about how the impact was immediate. The patient was much better the next day. So at least in their minds, they thought that a calibrutinib was very beneficial and they documented as a possible mechanism monocyte production of IL-6 being decreased in the treated patients. So it's not controlled, but if you sort of put these three studies together, I think you can get to a point where you think maybe having no B cells isn't deleterious and may even be beneficial, which is a strange way to think about it, right? So I'm going to spend the next few slides talking about a study that I was a part of. This study is not published. It is deposited in BioArchive, and Isabel Mates is the lead author. It's a registry study that collected 71 patients with inborn errors of immunity. So overall, 60% of the patients were hospitalized, and there was a mortality rate of 11%, which is the same as the general population. That is generally between 10 and 13%. So I have somewhat artificially put the ages of the patients who died on the graph that you see in the corner. And I'm going to spend a moment because I'm going to show this graph five more times. So we might as well just make sure it makes sense to everyone. So it's percent mortality on the y-axis. And then across the x-axis, I've binned patients into different age groups. The blue bars represent the mortality rate published by the CDC and the red bars are from this study. So what I hope you can take away from this study is that there is still an age effect. So age still trumps most of the other risk factors that we know about. I'm gonna go through each of the deaths, believe it or not, one by one. I think there is a, I think there is a message in here I want to try and get out. So we tend to think of the young kids as being relatively resilient. So here was a two-year-old in this box um, who had chronic granulomatous disease that was not diagnosed and at the time of death had hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis and 
Burkholderia sepatia. So we do sometimes see that in CGD. The patient was also infected with COVID-19 and unfortunately did die. But we do see an increased risk of hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis in CGD, and it is most often triggered by bacterial infections. So um, I don't know what role COVID played in this particular patient. Which, which is not to diminish its role. It's just hard to know whether it precipitated the HLH or was just um, a silent bystander. In this second young person who died, this was a combined immune deficiency and the patient died of sepsis and again, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. I mention this because of course, there's sort of broiling cytokines in COVID-19 and whether that pushes people to develop HLH or whether it's their own intrinsic genetic condition is not yet answered. I'll go through the remainder quickly, but um, I want you to see them because there's a theme. So the way this is set up is that over on the left, I'm gonna list their inborn error of immunity. I'm going to next list their comorbid conditions and then their cause of death. So here we have two patients with antibody deficiency. They had cardiomyopathy or lymphoma, so two different patients. And their ultimate cause of death was sepsis, renal failure, and heart failure. You're going to see something very much like this in the next two slides. So another two patients with antibody deficiency, their comorbid conditions were lung disease and heart disease, and their cause of death was sepsis and renal failure. And then here we have two more patients in the oldest age bracket that are antibody deficient, comorbid conditions of lung disease, heart disease, kidney failure, and diabetes, but their cause of death sepsis and renal failure. So really we've got two main causes of death. We've got the HLH in the younger folks and we've got sepsis in the older folks. But remember the overall mortality rate in this cohort was not any different than the general population. So if I describe this overall cohort, which has a range of different immune deficiencies, so it's not a very unified cohort. I'll show you in a minute the breakdown. We saw 7% HLH, which is certainly higher than the general population that's hospitalized. We saw 6% kidney failure, and we saw 4% autoimmune cytopenias. Now, this raises a point that I think hasn't gotten a lot of press. In the general population with COVID-19, there's clearly an increased risk of autoimmune disease. Autoimmune cytopenias are seen, Guillain-Barre, vasculitis. So we do see this secondary emergence of autoimmunity after COVID-19, but it hasn't been very well established what the numbers are. So it's hard to say if this 4% autoimmune cytopenia is higher than the general population or not. So this is the overall um, diagnosis that I had promised you. So the large blue slice of the pie are all antibody deficient patients. The next um, slice of the pie that's dark red is CGD, yellow is combined immune deficiency, and so on. The cross hatches represent the patients who died. And so I just want to show you that it's not one diagnosis, that there are a range of diagnoses that, that had mortality in this survey. Now, this is going to change, right? This is 71 patients. We're still on a very steep learning curve about what COVID-19 does. But I will interject one small anecdote. When I was on service about two weeks ago, I admitted a little girl with a quite severe combined immune deficiency. Her T cell count was only 300 and she sailed through. She was admitted out of precaution um, but in fact, we discharged her in two days and did nothing for her. She really did very, very well. So I do not think that the T-cell count is going to be the thing that risk stratifies patients. So let me just end by spending a moment on vaccines, which is always a relevant topic for immune compromised patients, but I think um, takes on a slightly different cast when we are talking about it as the vaccines are in development. So I'll just spend a couple of slides on this. So as of August 10th, there were 202 potential vaccines. So I list a, a website at the end where you can go and track it. It's just mind boggling to me that there are so many vaccines in development. And of course, they are all different types. Surprisingly, RNA-based vaccines are among the leading contenders in Europe and the US. And then Russia has recently 
um, implemented an adenovirus vaccine in their country. You know, vaccines that we, vaccine types that we haven't really used before and don't have a lot of expertise with. So this really is a very rapid learning curve. So what are the options for antibody deficient patients, which is the largest group in any immune deficiency cohort? What can we do for them? Should they not get vaccines? Should they get vaccines? So one option is passive immunity. So um, you could use convalescent plasma, but it's very clunky. We don't always know what the titer is. Probably the better approach is monoclonal antibodies directed against the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, which are neutralizing, more on that in a minute. Um, those products are in development, and I think there's a lot of enthusiasm, not just for immune deficient patients, but for healthcare workers and other people to give them protection on the front lines. But what about the vaccines that will be implemented for the general population? Well, we have to be careful about the safety of live viral vaccines, of course. You, we generally say not to give live viral vaccines to immune deficient patients, although it really depends on the immune deficiency, right? We would give them to someone with a myeloid defect, but probably not someone with a severe T cell defect. So I don't really know which vaccines are going to be implemented in different countries. And I think it's hard to say which ones the patients would be eligible for. But I will say that other than a gamma globulinemia, most patients with antibody deficiencies do make some antibody. It's not very good, and that's why they're on immunoglobulin replacement. But they usually can make some, and there are vaccine studies looking at rabies vaccine, pneumococcal vaccine in patients with common variable, and showing that there's at least a little bit of antibody produced. So there might be benefit to the patients to get vaccinated even though they have an antibody deficiency. But the other thing to consider is whether they will get some benefit from having a T cell response to the vaccine. So that's not what we usually work on inducing, but certainly in other vaccines, other viruses, it does seem like having T cells that are primed and virus responsive are beneficial in mitigating severity. Now, certainly no guarantee that's gonna be the case for COVID-19 because it's been so peculiar in so many ways. But I think some people think that having primed T cells that are antigen responsive could be a benefit. And then I'm just gonna end with this bit of data that was very recently shared um, by Thomas Krell. And so if you are a clinical immunologist, I know for sure your patients have asked you will my immunoglobulin replacement protect me from COVID-19? And there's been conflicting data published already on that topic. So just to be clear, you can find antibodies to other coronaviruses that cross-react with SARS-CoV-2. So yes, you can find antibodies to other coronaviruses that cross-react to SARS-CoV-2 but they are not neutralizing antibodies. And what I love about this study is they actually used a bioassay for neutralization. So they weren't using surrogate markers. So they took 54 different immunoglobulin products and they tested them in a neutralization assay, which is hard to do, clunky to do. But I give them a lot of credit because this really clarifies the landscape for those of us that are seeing patients. So if you look at the graph over on the left, this is neutralizing antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 in 54 different immunoglobulin products, both from the US and from Europe. And you can see there's nothing. So the dotted line represents the minimum threshold for neutralization, nothing. So there's definitely no neutralizing antibodies in commercial immunoglobulin products at this time. It's gonna be different five years from now. But at this moment, the immunoglobulin products are not going to be protective for patients. And then just for comparison, they looked at antibodies to another common circulating coronavirus that causes a common cold, 229E. So this is, I think, the second most common coronavirus in epidemiologic studies. And you can see that their assay easily detected neutralizing antibodies in immunoglobulin to the other coronavirus. So it's not that the assay didn't work or um, they weren't able to detect the antibodies adequately. It's that there simply are no neutralizing antibodies to SARS-CoV-2, even though there might be cross-reactive antibodies. So I'm going to end now with an acknowledgement slide, but I come to you
Um, really very humble because I live and work in the United States. I'm in Philadelphia, which is in that really giant orange blob on this map that shows um, COVID activity as of last week. So I know the U.S. has gotten many things wrong. Um, and I also recognize that there has been an enormous learning curve. If you think about how fast the field has moved just since March of this year, it's really quite astonishing. And I do wanna call out IUIS again for promoting education and trying to um, help us all become familiar with the pathogenesis and to share our knowledge about immune responses. And of course, I want to end by thanking IUIS for having me. I do want to acknowledge Isabel Mate Stu Tangy um, for sort of crystallizing along with me the study of the 71 patients with inborn areas of immunity. So that was a registry study that started back in May, I think, and is now closed. It's been turned over to IPOPI, headed by Nizar Maloui, who's going to extend this survey. Um, and of course, I want to thank the patients who are always every day teaching us what we need to know, not just about COVID-19, but about the immune system. So I will end there. And then I'm just going to quick click through so you can see the references. And in many cases, the links are clickable for the ones that are on BioArchive. So hopefully that will help you. Uh, thank you, Kathleen. We are waiting just for Carmen. I'm sure she will be back in two seconds. Uh, can you hear me, Carmen? Uh, Kathleen? I can hear you, yes. Oh, perfect. So, hi. So Carmen should be here right now. So uh, okay. then we can start with the Q&A. Hi, okay. Carmen. We have uh, some questions from the audience. So uh, first of all, I, I found it a really interesting uh, and uh, especially the part of aging, because I think that's the, the, the key point that we have to, to focus in, because the, the, the most damaged population is the, the elderly, and uh, it's very important to know how to protect them and to keep the focus on them. That's uh, from my point of view, of course, but I think that's the, the, the key point. And uh, we have several uh, questions first of all um, uh, one that's the most voted uh, by your audience and it's a typical one uh, do you expect uh, that a uh, mutated and more pathogenic strain of SARS-CoV-2 uh, comes up what do you think about it so there's been a lot of um, controversy about that topic. So there is a mutation that is in some of the European viruses collected and about half of the U.S. So about half of the U.S. has a strain that's more aligned with the original Asian strain and about half have this mutated strain. And there's a lot of controversy about whether that mutation um, increases transmissibility and has anything to do with how pathogenic it is. Um, I am not a virologist, but my reading is that it's still very controversial. But do I think it could happen? Yes, it happens in most viral infections. Viruses are so um, mutation uh, rich Problem. that, of course, they will evolve over time. And I think only time will tell whether it leads to increased or decreased pathogenicity. Okay. Um we have another question. Do um, you have a, a suitable explanation uh, to the COVID-19 resistance to interferon type 1? Um, I, there's a really lovely study from China where they use inhaled interferon beta that's actually protective. So I think it does do something. I, I'm not sure the virus is interferon resistant. Like a lot of viruses, it tries to subvert the interferon response, but many viruses have that, including influenza. So um, the fact that it has evolved to subvert the interferon response doesn't mean that interferon is irrelevant in its defense. And I would say the Chinese study using beta interferon would suggest that it is important. Okay, thanks. Um, 
next one is uh, another I think quite typical question uh, because it, it it's on gender. Uh, some reports found that uh, women uh, had more uh, antibodies production and less uh, viral load. Um, which could the reason uh, for for this different behavior among genders? Yeah, so there's no denying the clinical data that male gender is an independent risk factor for disease severity and mortality. So there's no getting around that. Um, I do think that women in general produce more antibodies, right? So there's a lot of data looking at gender differences, and that's thought to be um, both important for host defense, but also associated with risk of autoimmunity that's increased in women. So a lot of these gender differences, I think, impact immune function in very broad ways. I don't know that I'd be so quick to draw a straight line from the antibody production to the increased um, survival of women with COVID-19, only because the immune deficient patients that are antibody deficient don't seem to do that differently. So yes, I agree there are important gender differences in host responses. And yes, there are gender differences in survival for COVID-19. I'm just not sure what the relevant ones are. Okay. Um, uh, another question uh, is about uh, a population difference. Uh, because there are some papers uh, that uh, report an association of uh, non-white uh, people with uh, severity. Do you think that's uh, due to social or to biological factors? Um, well, again, I am here before you in all humility. So in the U.S., we do not have universal health care. And there are huge societal differences, unfortunately, that persist today in healthcare delivery to people of color in the US. So most of the data that I'm aware on the topic that you um, asked about are from the US. I have not seen big differences in survival in Asia compared to the US. There are some differences from Africa and there I'm, I just don't know enough about their healthcare delivery to know um, what to attribute that to. Could there be genetic differences? Of course, we know that there are host differences, but I would be very reluctant to say it's um, race-based. Okay, and there, there is another related question. Um, uh, someone asked about uh, the different prognosis in the South African study, and uh, they asked uh, whether it could be different due to uh, the different uh, AIDS uh, strains or the different oh. HIV subtypes in there. Do you think they are related? To, uh, they have nothing to do. Um, that's a really interesting perspective. I did not think about that when I was reading the paper, I have to be honest. The authors actually did a beautiful job of trying to tease out whether tuberculosis was a contributor to their finding. So if I would urge you to read the paper, it's really nicely done, but I did not think about HIV strains. And so I'm not sure how, how you could tease out whether the HIV strain itself was contributing. So I, I can't answer that. Okay. And, um... There are, uh, there is another question about, uh, uh, people who is on biologic uh, drugs, um, whichever, but uh, they they uh, ask uh, about uh, the risk uh, related to thertolizumab pegol or whichever oh, yes. biologics. Do you think that's uh, relevant or not? So. Um, another demonstration of how far we've come in six months. So at the beginning of COVID-19, I think a lot of rheumatologists were taking their patients off biologics. And I think people were very surprised by that New York study, which was, I think, the first study to come out on biologics. And so now people have gone the other way. So 
they think that having active rheumatoid arthritis, having active lupus is probably a bigger risk factor for disease severity than the biologic use. So I, um, so I, I'm personally on a TNF inhibitor and I am happy to be on a TNF inhibitor and I certainly would not um, take myself off or in any way modify my dosing. So I think I showed you a small subset of the biologic data, but I think it's all very consistent it is not a risk factor for disease severity. So no reason to take patients off. Okay. Um, and there is a, a quite interesting uh, question um, uh, about uh, asymptomatics. Um, do, do you think, do you have a, an idea of whether the immune response is different or similar in asymptomatics as compared to uh, proper cases or uh, what do you think about it? So there's actually a fair bit of data and one paper that was highlighted just this week. So I'll start with the published study. So there are, um, at least three studies that looked at antibody titers um, stratified according to disease severity. And they were, again, all three quite consistent that the milder cases produced less antibody than the severe cases. So the data seemed pretty clear that disease severity does um, modify the antibody production. More severe disease, more antibody. The T cell study was actually quite different. And again, it's on BioArchive. It's um, I don't, it's not published and it just got a little bit of press this week. So the T cell study is interesting and fascinating in that it's the opposite. So no matter whether your disease was asymptomatic, severe, you have great T cell responses that are detectable in the blood. So why there would be that dichotomy is hard to understand, but I think it did surprise everyone. And as far as I know, the study that I just cited is the only one to look at magnitude of T cell responses stratified by disease severity. Okay. And um, what about uh, cytokine or chemokine profiles um, regarding immunodeficient patients? Uh, are they different from general COVID patients? And um, I, I would dare to to extend this question together with the, the, the previous one. Uh, uh, do you think there are, or uh, it's it published anywhere that there are differences in chemokine profiles from asymptomatic, symptomatics, and uh, immunodeficient? So no, as far as I know, no data at all. So I, the, as far as I know, the papers that I presented today are the only data out there and they're all clinical. Um, so I, I can't answer that question, but you have to wonder if the reason that antibody deficient patients seem to do well when they have no B cells is that they produce less IL-6. We know from other studies, in fact, the original studies to come out of China showed that high serum IL-6 was associated with worse outcome, more intensive care utilization. So, and we've, we've harnessed that information therapeutically and used tocilizumab to treat the patients in the ICU with ARDS. So you have to wonder if maybe lacking B cells is beneficial because you have a lower level of IL-6. But in terms of actual data, as far as I know, there's none. Okay. And um, someone uh, asked about uh, uh, Arjubedic treatments. Uh, what do you think about uh, immune response and Ayurvedic treatments? Um, um, I don't know. I think leading a healthy, balanced life, I think having a good diet as prescribed by Ayurvedic medicine is always going to be helpful. I think there's lots of studies showing that diets that are high in sugar and high in fat lead to chronic inflammation, and chronic inflammation does seem to be a contributor maybe to disease severity. So I can't comment on that, but I will say a healthy and balanced life is definitely a good place to be right now. I agree. <laughs> and uh, would you advise uh, to antibody deficient patients to take any prophylaxis? Uh, that's a great question. So 
in the two Italian studies that came out that really have the best clinical description, they did comment on pneumonia. Now, since then, we've come to realize that COVID-19 causes a lot of pulmonary damage on its own. That's not necessarily bacterial pneumonia. But in their studies, they definitely felt that um, pneumonia was a contributor to their to their disease state. So I think they I think if they were sitting here instead of me, they would probably advocate for antibody prophylaxis. I guess I'm still a little bit on the fence about that. Okay. And um, I, I've kept uh, a couple of very, very interesting questions to, to the end. And um, what do you think about recurrence of COVID infection? Um, is it possible? Is it uh, a diagnostic uh, mistake or what is it? What do you think? Carmen, I think I missed the first part of your question. Could you repeat it? Uh, do you think it is possible to uh, to get a reinfection, a recurrence in the same patient to, uh, twice, twice infected by COVID? Oh, Carmen, that's a tough question. Um, so here, so here's what we know. So what we know is that people can shed virus. So if your detection strategy is PCR, we know that a lot of times you can recover nucleic acid by PCR and not have infectious virus. So the first paper to come out from Korea that said, oh my goodness, we've got, I think they were sailors. We've got Korean sailors that are getting reinfected probably just reflected um, shedding of nucleic acid and not, not actual infectious particles. And the reason I say that is if you look at the time window, it was pretty quick. It was in a month of their primary infection. So I would say to date, there has not been a convincing story of reinfection with COVID-19. But, and this is a big but, um, there are, there's a beautiful study that looked at other coronaviruses. So these common respiratory infections. So this is a study to come out of New York and they were doing healthcare screening. So they were seeing, these are kids, but they were seeing kids back as part of a screening study and they would just take viral swabs as part of their overall assessment. And what they were able to show was for these other coronaviruses, people got reinfected at a rate of about every two to three years with the same virus. Now, not everyone got reinfected, but among those who got reinfected, the time frame was about two to three years. So I would say it is altogether possible that without a vaccine, people could get COVID-19 again, but probably not in that one to two month time window, probably after a longer period of time. But that's all supposition based on other coronaviruses. Okay, and um, about uh, this study you, you've, you've talked right now, uh, did it confirm that uh, there were different strains of coronaviruses? Or um, is there any possibility that uh, they, they kept uh, something like a reservoir and an inner reservoir of the same virus. So no two infections, but one and a latency period. Would be it possible? Yeah, I do think it's possible. Um, coronaviruses are not known to do that, but I have to say that um, when people have looked super hard for viruses that we imagined are eradicated by our immune system, we sometimes find them. So the example I would give is adenovirus. So adenovirus was not thought to have a reservoir in the human body, but it turns out it does. So I think as technology and sensitivity improves, we'll be better poised to answer that question. Does SARS-CoV-2 have a reservoir in our bodies? Does it persist? I don't know. Um, I don't think so because if you look at the studies of viral shedding using nasal swab PCRs, there is a, a steady decline over time, suggesting it's just leftover from the primary infection. So um, there's no data at this moment to suggest that there's a reservoir, 
but I also think the kinds of studies that would be needed to reveal a reservoir haven't been done yet. They're actually quite hard to do. Okay. And um, I think that would be a nice last question for you. Um, it's very typical. Uh, when do you think we are going to get uh, nice and proper and, and, and wonderfully working vaccine? What do you think? Uh, I think every single person on this webinar wants to know that. Um, I, I, I don't know. So there, to be fair, Russia has already rolled out a vaccine. It's an adenovirus-based vaccine. It didn't have a lot of testing. On the other hand, it doesn't induce an immune response. It does utilize a backbone of something that we think should be safe. I actually give them a lot of credit for saying that we've weighed the pros and cons and we think it's better to just get the vaccine out. In Europe and the US, we're a little more constrained by um, legal aspects related to um, getting medicines and vaccines on the market. So they will be required to undergo quite extensive testing. I only think we're gonna understand which vaccines are best because there will be multiple vaccines out. Um, I think we're only gonna understand that maybe a year from now. I think there's no great answer right now, but to end on a happier note, look at the massive amount of money and technology that has been brought to bear on this pandemic. Look at the amazing transparency. I mean, people are sharing data in ways that they never would have before this, and people are collaborating across borders. You probably noticed that some of the papers I cited were multinational studies where people had to come together. That's got to be the way that moves us past this. It will be the way that we get the vaccine implemented in the right way, and it's going to be the way that we finally understand how to treat the patients. So just to end on a happier note, I, I'm 61 years old. I've seen a lot of things come and go. I have never seen people come together in the way that they have for COVID-19. Okay. Um, then I think uh, we that's the end of the webinar. Uh, thank you very much, Caitlin. It, it has been uh, really a big pleasure to, to talk with you and uh, I've loved your presentation and I've loved uh, the discussion you've made of the questions. Uh, the questions have been very interesting things Thanks as well to to everybody who made questions and uh, to uh, any attendees in here. Uh, I've been told to remember you that next Monday there is another webinar of the US. You can consult in, uh, in the web. And um, I think uh, that's all. Just uh, thank you all of you for, for being here with us. Bye. Thank you, Carmen. Bye, Kathleen. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too.